And please be seated. It is good to see all of you here this day. And as we come this morning to witness the baptism of Mark Glode, I invite you please to turn with me in your copy of the scriptures to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, our passage for this morning, which was recommended that I preach today by Mark's longtime dear friend, Alan. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Five, at verse 17, the Apostle Paul writes the following and says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, at verse 17, this is the word of God. Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Well, let's pray together before we come to the word of God for today. Let's pray together. Our great and glorious God, we are so thankful that you have assembled us here this day to worship your name and to witness the baptism of our brother Mark. We're so thankful, Lord, for those things that you do in the lives of people, calling them from afar and making them your very own. Oh, Lord, you are so merciful to the sons of men. You give us grace when we deserve nothing but judgment and wrath. You give us love when we deserve your anger. And so we bless you, O God, for your many kindnesses extended to many even in this place this day, and all of this through Jesus Christ the Lord. O God, we are so grateful that you are a God who is full of mercy and full of grace. And we ask, O oh, wonderful Lord, that as we come to your word this day, that you would send the Holy Spirit to us to animate and anoint all that will be said and done. We pray, O oh God, that you would move among us. You know the various ones here this day. You know exactly what they need. And so we ask, O oh God, that you would minister to each one for their good and for your great glory we pray and we ask all of these things in and through that wonderful name of Jesus Christ our Lord amen the story is told that when Augustine, that great Christian theologian, was still without hope and without Christ in the world, that the Holy Spirit convicted him of his sin against God, based upon the words of the Apostle Paul, as found in Romans chapter 3, where Paul says there, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in order to fulfill its lust. Well, upon reading these words, Augustine repented of his sins and trusted in Jesus Christ alone for life and salvation. And he was radically converted so that this debased sinner was instantly made a devout saint and this great rebel was instantly made a righteous man in God's son. Well, sometime after his conversion, the account goes that while Augustine was walking through the marketplace, that a, a former, a female companion of his that he used to be sinfully involved with, began crying out to him, saying, Augustine, Augustine, it's me, it's me. To which Augustine, in reflecting on his 
new identity in Christ, replied saying to her, I know, but it's no longer me. It's no longer me. Now, uh, to be sure, dear ones here this day, we see from this example of Augustine that when God Almighty truly saves a person, he really saves them. We see that when someone truly experiences biblical, gospel salvation, they are really transformed from the inside out. Now, this is exactly what has happened to many of us in this place by God's free and sovereign grace. All of us who are now true Christians, true believers, were at one time living very sinful, very wicked lives apart from God. We were living in great wickedness, and yet because God completely changed us through the power of the gospel, we can say that by his grace we are now no longer the people we used to be. We can say that now we have been made brand new individuals forevermore. Blessed be his name. Well, this morning, it is our great delight to consider how this very thing happened in the life of our dear brother, Mark. Mark, as you probably know, has been among us for about a year at this time. And he, in fact, has experienced true biblical gospel salvation. Now, for our time together today, I want to speak about all that I've just said to you with reference to salvation from our passage in view. This morning, I want us to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, which very plainly highlights to us what it means to be a true Christian. And this so that we all can be instructed and helped about this matter for our spiritual good. Now, by way of some background, information to this second epistle to the Corinthians, which was written by Paul around A.D. 56, we see that since Paul's first letter to this church, apparently some false teachers had sought to turn the church against the apostle. These false apostles had put all kinds of wrong ideas in the minds of the Corinthians concerning Paul, saying, for example, that he was quite fickle, saying that Paul, for example, was full of pride and that he was very unimpressive in appearance and in speech. Well, because they did this, this is why we see throughout this second letter the apostle defending his conduct to the Corinthians. We see him defending his character and his credentials to these brethren. Now specifically, in chapter 5 of this book, as we have it before us this morning, as Paul continues to defend his ministry, he speaks about two things specifically, namely reassurance from and reconciliation with God. Now, concerning reassurance from God, which is spoken of in the opening part of this chapter, Paul says here to these believers that the reason why he and his fellow ministers did not faint under the various hard trials that they were experiencing was because of the promise of God that when they died, they in fact would go to be with him forevermore. In fact, Paul nicely summarizes this whole matter in verse 8 of this chapter when he says, look at the words with me there in your Bibles, he says, we are confident, yes? Well, pleased, rather. And here's what Paul is confident and well pleased about, that to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Well, secondly, then, in this chapter, there is the matter concerning reconciliation with God, and the Apostle Paul speaks about this theme in verses 12 to 21, again, of this chapter. Now, specifically, 
At the end of verse 11 in this chapter, the apostle appeals to this church saying that he knows that he and his fellow workers are well known in the consciences of the Corinthians, which is to say that despite what the false teachers and the false apostles were saying about them, he knew that the Corinthians could vouch, could speak with reference to their gospel integrity as ministers of Christ. They could do this. And why? Well, it's because they knew what kind of men they had been among them. Well, because this was so, notice with me next what Paul says in verses 12 to 13 of this chapter, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 12 and 13, he says, For, look at the language, we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance, i.e. the false apostles, and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. Well, just so that these Christians can know exactly why it was that Paul loved them and labored so hard for them, despite what the various errorists were saying. Notice with me what he says next in verses 14 to 15 of this chapter. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15, Paul says, Here's the reason why we do it. For the love of Christ compels us. Because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that is to say his people, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Well, here as I said, we have the apostle putting forth the grand reason why it was that he loved these Corinthian believers so much. And why was this? Well, According to his language in what we just read, he loved them so much because Christ loved them so much. Oh, church, I say that Paul gave himself completely to them. And why? Well, it's because Christ had given himself completely for them. Consequently, this is why Paul could say in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that he was willing to quote, spend and be spent for their souls. Well, this then gives us some background information and the general setting of our words in view for this morning. This is the heart. This is the core. This is the soul of the matter at hand. Now, in verses 16 and 17 of this chapter, Having just spoken of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ for us, the apostle now draws two logical conclusions from this. For all who have received Jesus' salvation, and this is seen in how each one of these verses begins with the little word, therefore, therefore. And so notice this with me first in what Paul says in verse 16 of this chapter. Having just set forth the glorious gospel, good news, which is found in Jesus Christ. He says now, verse 16, note it there in your Bibles, therefore, or so then, from now on, we that is Paul and his traveling companions, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, that is to say, when we were not saved. Yet now, Paul says, that is, as Christians, we know him thus no longer. And so what then is the Apostle Paul speaking of here? Well, simply stated, he's speaking about that radical, supernatural change that happened in his own heart when he was saved with reference to his own pride and prejudice. You see, church, before Paul was converted, he was a proud religious Jew who looked down his nose at others who were not Jewish, viewing them as second-class citizens or even worse. Ah, but church, when Paul 
got saved. God dramatically changed this evil disposition which was within him when he got converted. He stopped judging people based upon ethnicity, based upon class, based upon wealth, etc. And why? Well, it's because now he saw all people as himself, namely image bearers of the Almighty God. Well, not only did Paul come to see non-Jews or Gentiles in a, a different light after God had wonderfully saved him, but he also says in 16b of this chapter that he came to see Jesus Christ differently as well. He came to see Jesus differently. Here he says that although at one time he knew Christ according to the flesh, now, however, he says in our verse that he no longer knows him in this way. And so what does he mean? Well, he means that before he became a Christian, Paul viewed Jesus Christ like many unsaved Jews did in that time, namely as some upstart rabbi who was causing all kind of trouble in and around Jerusalem. Uh, Paul saw Jesus Christ as a menace. Hence, he sought to destroy everything about him, and of course, as we know from the book of Acts, his followers as well. Ah, but although at first, Paul, at that time his name being Saul, although at that time, Saul of Tarsus saw no beauty in Jesus that he should desire him, even as Isaiah foretold would be the case with many Jews. After Saul got saved, nonetheless, he saw Jesus in truth, which is to say, he saw him as the altogether lovely one. After he was converted, he saw Jesus as he really is, according to the Bible, namely, the Jewish Messiah, the Roman Aaron, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Glory be to his name. Well, what a wonderful, what a fantastic change was wrought in this man who at first had such deep-seated biases within him. I mean, truly, Church Paul was transformed from the inside out. And this is because when God gets hold of a person in truth, this is exactly what happens to them. Well, in light of this, in verse 17 of this chapter, Paul now draws the second logical conclusion of those who have been saved, and we'll consider it firstly for this morning under our first heading in 17a of this chapter with reference to the fact of biblical salvation. The fact of biblical salvation. You see it there in your bulletins. Here as Paul speaks about the next result concerning this whole topic. He writes saying, look at the words with me again there in your Bibles. He says in the first part of our verse, verse 17a, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is, she is, a new creation. Now, in these words before us here, the apostle is putting forth the reality of what is true for anyone, underscore it, beloved ones here this day, for anyone who is a real, bona fide, Christian. Here he's saying that this is an undeniable fact for all people concerning this matter. Thus, this is why he begins these words here saying, look at them carefully, therefore, if anyone, if anyone, regardless of who they are, regardless of what they've done, regardless of their background, their age, their ethnicity, etc. Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, quite literally now from the Greek text, new creation, new creation. 
If anyone is in Christ, Paul says, new creation. That is what they are. Now I trust that in these words that I've been highlighting to you, I trust that you see in these words the universality of them, right? I trust, dear ones here this day, that you see that they are comprehensive so that if anyone says that they are a true Christian, be that a male or female, a young person, an old person, a rich person, a poor person, a black person, a white person, a weak person, a strong person, etc. If anyone says I'm a Christian and they're not a new creation, well, guess what, church? Guess what? Well, their statement is false, according to Paul. You see, here again, he says that if anyone, which is to say, whoever one may be, if they in fact have experienced the salvation which Jesus gives, then all of them, without exception, have become new people. Now, again, dear ones, According to the Bible, this is just the plain fact of the matter. This is the case, thus I thoroughly agree with Thomas Watson, that great minister from another generation, when he said that in this verse we have the essence and the soul of religion. Now, of course, what Paul is saying here in our passage in view is not unique to it. And why? Well, it's because he speaks like this in other places in the Word of God as well, right? Uh, he does. Thus, this is why if you're taking notes, he says, for example, in Romans chapter 6, that true Christians have died to sin and that they now walk how? Well, he says that they now walk, quote, in newness, in newness of life. And then further in this regard, in Ephesians 4, Paul says that when people get truly saved, they have, quote, put on and continue, or they actually says they have put off, firstly, and continue to put off through the process of sanctification the old man. And they have put on the new man who is created in true righteousness and holiness. And so this then, beloved ones here this day, summarily speaking, according to the Apostle, is what is true for anyone, again, whoever they are, who is in Christ. This is the fact of the matter, and of course, uh, the all-important question that we need to ask and answer at this point is, what does it mean to be in Christ? If anyone is in Christ, this is what is true of them. And so what does it mean to be in Christ? Well, this is one of the most beautiful and significant, vital, important questions and, uh, for us to consider, and one of the most important and significant words in all of the Word of God. You see, uh, dear ones, to be in Christ, to be in Christo, means to be in the realm of Christ, one of the most important and significant phrases in the Bible. To be in Christ means to be in the realm of Christ. It means to be in a real, not fake or hypothetical, no, but a real, supernatural, unbreakable spiritual union with Him. If anyone is in Christ, he is this. What does it mean to be in Christ? It means to be in the realm of Jesus. To be in a real, not again fake or hypothetical, but a a real supernatural, unbreakable, spiritual union with Him. Now, uh, you should also note that to be in Christ is one of Paul's most uh, popular phrases in the New Testament. Not just beautiful and significant, but it's one of his most popular phrases. And in putting it as simply as I can, we can say that this phrase means to be a genuine Christian. Therefore, if anyone is, we could say, a genuine Christian, he is a new creation, as simply as I can state it. It means to be one who is in a realized fellowship with Christ, being connected with him because of the salvation, 
which God, by the Holy Spirit, through the gospel, has worked in the life of an individual. Now, church, it's, it's absolutely vital that we see when Paul speaks here about biblical salvation, our theme in view for today, that he doesn't say that if anyone is in the church, he is a new creation. No. And also, it's vital that we see here that he doesn't say that if anyone is in the waters of baptism, they are a new creation. No. And why is this? Well, the answer is simple. And it's because being in the church or getting baptized does not make anyone a new creation. No. And why? Well, it's because when a person becomes a new creation, according to the Bible, they receive a new birth from above. And nothing we could ever do could produce this in us. No, dear ones, only God himself could do this in us. Thus, this is why we're told, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30, but of him, that is to say God the Father, but of him you are in Christ. And so, here, the Apostle Paul is speaking about that mystical, that experiential, that realized communion that Christians who have been saved by the free grace of God experience in their souls with the living Savior. This is the case in church in view of this. I must pause to say that if anyone has not experienced this, then they are no true Christians at all. Well, dear ones, I say to you this day that they are fakers. They are phonies. And this is because this very matter here is what separates true believers from pretenders. Now, the implications of actually a being spiritually joined to Christ by way of biblical salvation, the implications are vast. I mean, because this is so, we're told, for example, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, that we now have been adopted into God's family. Further in this regard, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7b, in Ephesians 1, verse 14, we're told that the implications are that we've been forgiven of all of our sins and that we now have an eternal inheritance. Well, along with all of these glorious realities, and many more could be added to them, Paul says next in our verse, look at it with me there in your Bibles, he says that if anyone, whoever they are, is in Christ, is a true Christian, then he is what? Well, he says he is a new creation. Now here again, as the apostle states the absolute certainty of this matter, he doesn't say that if anyone is in Christ, they ought to be a new creation. No. Nor does he say that they should be a new creation. No. But rather he says quite emphatically in the original text that they are a new creation, and this without qualification or exemptions. Yes, here Paul says that biblical salvation makes people, brand new individuals. And all of this absolutely makes perfect sense since the word new here means that which was not there before. Now, of course, having said this, this does not mean that those who have become new creations in Christ Jesus have become perfectly sinless people. That would be nice, but that is not the case. Uh, but it does mean, dear ones here this day, that they have become different people. 
So that although at one time they used to love the things of this world and love and live in ungodliness, etc., just like Augustine himself did, now, however, by the grace of God, they have been changed. Now, because the Almighty God has worked a miracle of grace in their lives, they love Jesus. They hate their sins. And they are trusting in Christ alone for life and salvation with the great desire to please Him all of their days, come what may. Well, this then is what has happened to our dear brother Mark, who will be baptized in a few minutes. Or church, I say that Mark is a new creation. Mark is a miracle of God's grace. Well, what a marvel this is, right? I mean, it is absolutely astounding. It's incredible. And biblically speaking, kind of as a side note here, it's interesting to note that this new creation in the soul is actually compared to the old creation that God did when he made the world. And this comparison is even put forth in this very book in chapter 4 and verse 6. And you can turn with me there in your Bibles if you'd like to see it. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6. Here, as Paul makes this comparison, he says this. Look. He says, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, which is to say, when he made the original world in the early chapters of Genesis, Paul says, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has done what? Well, he says, who has, quote, shone in our hearts. That is to say, shone in our hearts when he regenerated us and made us new creations in Christ Jesus. To what end? Well, he says in the passage, in order to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Christ. Now, having just spoken of this comparison, I must say, brethren, that personally I believe that the new creation concerning salvation in the heart of an individual is even greater than the old original creation of the world. Even greater than this whole matter. Now, this is so, and Mr. Spurgeon agrees for in writing about this topic he says quote what was there to begin with when God made the world well he says there was nothing and nothing could not stand in God's way for it was at least passive ah but then Spurgeon says however in our hearts while there was nothing in them that could help God that is to say help God or work with God to make us new creations, Spurgeon says there was much that could and did oppose him, such as our stubborn wills, our deep prejudices, and our ingrained love of iniquity. Well, he says, quote, all these opposed God and aimed at thwarting his design for us. Thus, while it was great for God to make the world it was even greater for him to create a new creature in Christ Jesus, to which I say yes and amen. Well, having seen first within for today in 17a of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you could jump back there. The fact of biblical salvation. Come with me now secondly and more briefly to note in 17b, its face, its face or what it actually looks like. Now, here the apostle doesn't leave us guessing at all with reference to this whole matter concerning exactly what someone's creation in Jesus looks like. When he says that in their lives, look at the passage with me again in your Bibles, he says, quote, old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. Now in these words here, 
Paul speaks firstly negatively and then secondly positively. And so first negatively he says that in the life of the genuine Christian, all things have passed away. Now, of course, by saying this, uh, Paul is not saying that true Christians never struggle in their lives or that they're not tempted with uh, things in the world. No, for surely they are. Uh, you see, dear ones, at times even the best of Christians say with the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, when writing as a Christian, Paul said, for what I will to do, that I do not practice. And what I hate, that I do. True Christians struggle. They struggle, even though they're true Christians. Well, if this is the case, then what is the apostle speaking of here? When he says again, concerning those who are in Christo, those who are in Christ, that old things have quite literally definitively passed away in their lives. Well, what he's speaking about is that from the very day we were saved and spiritually joined to Jesus by faith, there was a radical severance with our old selves. That's what he's speaking about. What he's speaking about is that there was a, a radical break and a breach with who we used to be. Uh, the point is, from that very moment of conversion, there was a death blow that was given to our old sinful natures. So that according to Romans chapter 6, Paul says there that when we were saved, the old man was crucified, was put to death at the cross. He was crucified. He was put to death with Christ. Well, brethren, I say that this is the case. So that although sin still remains in us, blessed be God that it no longer reigns in us. Right? Although sin is still resident, we can bless God that it is no longer president. And so, in this sense then, we can say that the old things of the flesh, the old man, are in principle put away. There's been that spiritual divide so that our former unsaved, sin-dominated lives have passed away. Well, not only is this true with reference to our old selves, but it's also true with reference to our old values right? Oh, church, I say that it's true with reference to our old views, our old ideas, our old plans, our old desires, our old prejudices, our old pride and our old beliefs, etc. Yes, it's true regarding all of these things, and I say praise God for this. Yes, praise God that because of biblical salvation, the wicked old things of our old lives no longer rule. They no longer dominate us. Ah, but having said this, negatively speaking, uh, there is now further the positive side of the matter. As Paul puts it forth in this verse. And as he begins to highlight this to us, he uses, look at the text, the little word behold in our passage. You see it there in your Bibles. Here Paul says, look at it again, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is a true Christian, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, or more literally, look and see and take note at how glorious it is. He says, behold, marvel at it. All things have become new. And so, in what sense then can it be said that everything has become new from the day we were saved, if we are true Christians, even until this very day? Well, while surely they have become new with reference to our standing before God, and surely they have become new with 
reference to our relationship with him through Jesus. We can also say that for us who have experienced genuine salvation, that now we have new affections for the things of God. Right? We can say that we have new inclinations toward Him. And that now we have an entirely new course and conversation of life. Well, this is what dear brother Mark Glode can testify to in his own life. And for this, all of us can praise God. We can praise God. And why? Because he's been so merciful to him. Well, as I begin then to wind down for today, I want to do so by making a few applications before Brother Mark gets baptized. And so let me do this by speaking firstly to those of you here this day who are true Christians, to you who have been born from above, to you who are genuine believers. What can I say to you in view of all that we've considered today? Well, there are three things. Three things. And the first is, listen carefully, since you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, I say, dear ones, that you are to give praise to God for this since your salvation is all of Him. All of Him. Or brethren, I say that it's all of His free and His sovereign and His electing grace in Christ Jesus. Thus, this is why, after speaking about biblical salvation in our text in view for today, that the very next thing that Paul says in 18a of this chapter, look at it with me there in your Bibles, he says, now all of these things are of God. All of these things are of God. What things, Paul? The salvation I've been speaking about. These are all of God. These are all pertaining to God. When someone becomes a new creation in Christ Jesus, they don't work with God. No, God works with them, and he works with them all by himself. All by himself. Therefore I say, dear ones here this day who have experienced genuine salvation, give praise to God. You were not seeking God, but God was seeking you. And guess what? He got you. For all that he seeks, he gets. And when he got you, he saved you. He made you a new creation. He transformed your life. He forgave you of all of your sins. He adopted you into his family. He made you his very own. Shouldn't he get praise for this? He should. And that praise should come from us, dear brothers, dear sisters, here this day. May we never cease praising our great God. Again, I quoted the passage earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul says, but of him you are in Christ. Of him it was God's will that we would be joined to Christ. But of him, the Father, you are in Christ. Who has become for us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption? But of him you are in Christ. And here's why in this place as Reformed Christians, we give praise to God and not to men. We don't pat ourselves on the back when it comes to salvation. We praise Jesus. Amen. It wasn't my coming to Christ, my making a decision for him, my seeking him. I wasn't seeking him, I was seeking my sin. Augustine was seeking his sin. But Jesus sought him, and he got him. That's the same thing that's true for you here this day, my dear brother, my dear sister. God sought you, and he found you. He rescued you, rescued you out of your miserable life, spiritually speaking, when you were lost and in a far country away from God, with all the guilt and all the shame, and all the confusion, he came after you by the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, and he made you a Christian. Isn't that good news? Thank God that he didn't leave us in our fallen state. Thank God that he didn't leave us in this fallen mass of mankind to be unsaved, to not know God. 
to be under his judgment. What a miserable condition. But God was merciful to you, dear brother, dear sister. Therefore, bless his name all the day long. Secondly, Christian, since you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, I say that you are to live in light of this. Regularly saying no to sin and yes to the Savior. There is a moral and ethical implication connected to being in Christ. And that moral, that ethical implication is live holy. Live holy. You are a child of the king, a son of the king, a daughter of the king. What sin are you playing with, Christian, right now that you know is not pleasing to God? What thing is it? What is it? What is it? You've been born anew. You've got a new life in Christ. You're now God's property and possession. Should we be living like the world? Should we be entertaining sin? Like the rest? Oh, no, no, no. No. We need to regularly be repenting of our sins. Asking God the Holy Spirit to help us to mortify the deeds of the flesh. What sin are you involved with, dear Christian? Whatever it might be, you could think about it this afternoon in the theater of your own conscience. Whatever it might be, repent of it. Husbands not loving their wives as Christ loved the church. Wives not submitting to their husbands as unto the Lord. Children not obeying their parents in the Lord. It's inconsistent with one who's in a state of grace. There is an ethical, a moral implication to our passage. We're new creations in Christ Jesus. Old things, old self have passed away. Behold, all things are continually becoming new. And so keep them new, brother, sister, here this day. War against your sins. Fight against them. Regularly say no to them. No to those bad thoughts. No, no to that foul tongue. No to, that, to those eyes that are wandering in places they shouldn't go. We must live in light of the fact that we are new creations in Christ Jesus. And thirdly and finally for us who are Christians. Since... We are new creations in Christ Jesus. This means that we are to love all those who have experienced the same thing in their lives. And why? Well, it's because we're all part of the same spiritual family. We're to love the brethren. In fact, one of the first things that happens when someone gets saved is they begin to love Christians. They begin to love Christians. And when you are a non-Christian... Talk about loving Christians, you might be, yeah, they're a little weird with all their Bible thumping, etc. But now you love them because they're the salt of the earth. Because like you, they are new people who love Jesus and want to live for him. And so I say specifically, let me make the application a bit more pointed. Dear ones in this church, you're to be sure that by the grace of God, with the Holy Spirit's empowerment, you are treating everyone in this place with great love and great affection. That's what Christians do. That's how they live. They love the brethren. In fact, the Apostle John says, 1 John 3 and verse 14, that we know that we have passed from death to life. How do we know, John? Well, because we say we pass from death to life. No. We know that we have passed from death to life. So simple. Because we love the brethren. It's so simple. The first fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. Love. And love is not expressed just by not treating others badly. No. Agape love is active. And so it's by actively treating others well. By engaging with them. How are you? How can I pray for you? What's going on in your life? That is agape. It's not just the negative side. Well, I haven't, you know. 
stepped on anyone's toes, quite literally, so I must be loving them. No. You love them by giving yourself for them. John says we know that we pass from death to life, which means we become Christians. How? Because we love the brethren. And he who does not love his brother, what does he say? He doesn't say he's a carnal Christian, no. He says he abides in death. He says he's not a true Christian. And so since, for many of us in this place, we have experienced the powerful, transforming grace of God in our hearts so that we're new men and women in Christ Jesus, we're to love everyone here who says that they are Christians as well because we're called in the Word of God to love the brethren. And so may we always do it in this place. May this be the most loving place in all the world. And so what about for you here this day? Who, after having heard this message, after listening to me for the past 45 minutes, know for sure that you are not a true Christian who has experienced genuine biblical salvation. What can I say to you, my dear friends here, this day? Well, simply this, that without a doubt, you definitely underscore it. Make no mistake about it. You definitely need God to make you a new creation. You, you definitely. This is not negotiable. This is not, well, that's good for you. It's not good for me. This is God's word. You absolutely need to become a new creation. For if not, you'll never know God in this life, and you certainly won't know him in the life to come. You really need to have Jesus Christ wash you of all of your sins before God and to make you something that you've never been before and you can never make yourself. And all of this so that you can be made right with God. And all of this based upon Jesus' death on the cross in the place of sinners, even sinners like you. You must become a new creation. You can't make yourself a new creation. This is not about turning over a new leaf. This is not about, oh, I'm going to improve myself this year. That's not what this is speaking of. This is speaking about having God do something for you that you cannot do for yourself. And so what then must you do in your life from the human side of things if you're going to see this happen in your life? Well, there's only one answer and only one thing you can do according to Scripture. And it is that you must call upon Jesus to save you. You can't save yourself, but he most certainly can. You must call upon Jesus to save you. And this is because we're told in Romans chapter 10, that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Maybe you're sitting here this day and you say, what is all this saved conversation all about? What does it mean to be saved? The word simply means to be delivered. It's easy enough to be delivered. You say, what do I need to be delivered from? Answer yourself. Answer your sins. Answer the penalty of those sins. Do you because of your sin against God. You need to be delivered. Just like everyone in this place and everyone in the world. We all need to be delivered from the judgment of God due us because of our sins against him. How could we be delivered from God's judgment due us? Because of our sins against him. The answer of the Bible is plain. God provided a substitute for guilty sinners who would take that judgment upon himself in their place so that they could go free. And I asked people, do you know anyone who died in the place of guilty sinners, took the judgment of God due them in his own holy self so that they could be forgiven? And so many times people say no. And I say, well, let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus, the willing, the loving, sinless Savior, 
who was willing to go to the cross of Calvary and to take the sins of sinners upon himself and to be punished in their room and in their stead for the crimes that they had committed against God. And there at the cross, Jesus Christ bore all the wrath of God to them in their place. He absorbed it all fully, freely, and finally so that at the cross he says what? It is done. It is finished. I have accomplished the salvation of sinners. I have accomplished the deliverance of the guilty. That's what he did at the cross. Paid in full. I did it all through my work and my work alone. How do we know that God accepted it? Well, as you know, he was buried and then three days later he rose from the dead. This was God's validation to all of us here this day. The Father rose him from the dead. He raised him from the dead. This was God's receipt to all mankind saying, do what? Turn from your sins and trust in what my Son has done for sinners like you. The good news is Jesus paid the fine for guilty sinners like all of us here this day. He paid it in full 2,000 years ago. But how does that connect with us here this day, 2,000 years later? The answer, it connects to us when we turn from our sins. Oh God, I have sinned against you. I've lied, I've stolen, I've lusted, I've committed adultery, I've committed fornication, I've, I've been drunk, oh God. I haven't sought you. I put myself before you. You own your sins before God. You say, I'm turning from these sins. These sins which have been doing nothing good for my soul. You turn from those sins and then you look to God's mercy for you in the cross of Jesus Christ. Where there the Son of God is hanging and dying between heaven and earth as your substitute. You bow your head. You say, oh Lord, I don't deserve to be forgiven. I don't deserve that you would go in my place and die for me. I deserve to be punished. I deserve the wrath of God. But you in love went for people like me. I bow down and I worship you. I trust in you and what you've done for people like me as the only ground of my acceptance with God Almighty. Would you be saved today? Would you be delivered like our brother Mark has and many in this room, then I invite you, my dear friend, to come to Jesus Christ by faith and by faith alone. Whoever calls upon him will be saved. Lord, save me. Make me a true Christian. Oh, God, maybe you're here this day and say, I I've never heard the Bible preach and I've never seen that verse before. Oh, God, it's clear. I am not a new creation in Jesus. Oh, God, make me a Christian. Oh God, transform me, for if you don't do it, no one else can. But there's good news for you, my dear non-Christian friend here this day. Jesus is able to transform you, and he is willing to do it. He's able and he's willing. And so come to him this day, asking him for mercy and grace. And might it be that even this day, some who have come in here as non-Christians will leave this place as the children of God, as those who are redeemed and adopted into God's family, and know the joys of biblical salvation. Well, let's pray and commit our time to the Lord. Let's pray together. Our Father, we are so thankful for your word. We're thankful for its clarity. And we ask, O oh God, that you would use it for good for everyone here this day. For your people, that they would be built up in their most holy faith. And for those here this day who have not experienced the transforming power of God, O oh God, that they would desire this for themselves. This is the great thing that they need to happen in their lives. This is the answer for all their troubles. Do it, we pray, O oh God, for many. 
And for all of these things, we will praise and we will bless your most wonderful name. We ask them through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.